chatter in the outside the hall. I understand some of you had a, a relatively big night last night, so thanks for turning up. We'll try and keep it as light uh, as enjoyable as we can. My name's Ryan Smith. Um, I'm a business development executive with, with Coffee International. Um, just a caveat, I'm speaking today on behalf of myself rather than on behalf of the firm. And I'm going to draw on some lessons I've had probably over the last five or six years. So a little bit about myself and what qualifies me to talk to you uh, about changing market conditions and perhaps some of the approaches you can use in a professional services organization to, to thrive in, in a downswing market. So fortunately or unfortunately, a symptom of my age and geographic, find yourself in the right place in the wrong time. My experience, my strategic experience, my development experience, my market placement experience, and my business transformation experience has all been post GFC. Okay. So I did the, um, I, I built a business post GFC in the UK. For those of you who were unfortunate enough to, to be there, literally the order book was full on a Monday, and on a Tuesday it had about 20%. Okay. Okay. Very shocking um, and, and very scary times, and, and arguably the world financially has not been the same again since then. I then moved to the Middle East, uh, arguably one of the toughest commercial markets in the world, uh, and did the, the post-property crash market. Uh, and most re I worked in almost every country within the Middle East. That's actually the Middle East last week. Uh, most recently, I spent the last 18 months in Western Australia, off the back of the downswing in the market here, and I've applied some of those, those lessons and those principles that I've, I've adopted over the past six or seven years to here, with hopefully some, some good effect. So what I'd like to cover today is what's happening there's a great saying, and I'm going to tell a few stories, but you'll have heard this one before. If you put a frog in boiling water and boil it up, it will die. Okay. <laughs> Try it if you want. Um, if you drop a frog in boiling water, it'll jump, it'll jump straight out. Okay. And that's what happens in the market. If you're used to a certain market, you may not see the market you're in. Okay. It's very obvious to me. Coming here 18 months ago, looking at some base financial metrics of the economy is performing, it is clear as day as to what's happening. Okay? And I'm a bearer on the Australian market today. So what's happening, I want to look at a global context as well. I want to look at what we can do about it as a collective, as individuals, as firms, as industry groups, because that's important to understand what we can actually do about the market. I want to look at typically how firms behave and individuals behave in these downswings, particularly, and one of the things that we have here is a relative upswing for a long period of time. And some of your staff may never have known tougher market conditions and how they behave when this happens. Obviously, I think that some of those behaviors are perhaps not the best thing we should be doing. So what should we do? And we'll look at some macro concepts of what we should do. And then we'll look at some individual tactics in terms of actual market engagements and some of the processes and systems that, that I would advocate could potentially give you better returns for your cost of sale and market data. We'll look at will this work? So we'll look at some actual examples. I'll give you some tangible financial figures as to where it's been applied before. And one of the things that you, you'll find, what I'm presenting here today, is very simple. Okay. And that's by design. Okay. Business of its fundamental principles is simple. When you're in a downswing and the market is moving against you, simple is good, simple is fast, and simple is effective. But people don't do it. And there's some very fundamental psychological reasons why they don't do it. And we're going to touch upon those as well. And then to ask you guys the question, you know, will you do it? I'm going to show you A to B to C to D, how to do this. The really difficult piece is getting your business engaged to do it. And that's where Mark's going to take over. And Mark's going to speak to the second half of the presentation on how you implement some of these changes, some of these methodologies, which I'm going to present to you on a sustainable and ongoing basis. So that's really just what I've covered there. Some of the key learning outcomes. Recognizing your market is changing is key. Recognizing it fast is key. Okay. Recognizing critical failure factors as you see, as you make them, but more importantly, as you see your business make them. Okay. It's very easy lost in the noise and the dynamic of the market on a daily basis. So macro approaches and then some tactics. What's happening? These are just some snapshots of AFR that we've, we've pulled off. You guys are all in the WA market. You feel it. You know what's happening. Um, I'll give you some, some, some context. Peak price of iron ore US is just over 180 bucks a ton, February 2011. Today I think it's trading about 90 bucks a ton. I haven't checked this morning US. Okay. So it's about 50%. An economy that's heavily weighted to resources, that's a very significant impact, and you will feel that 
in the downstream service sectors that you're working in. Okay. Interest rate's 4.2 then, it's now 2.5. That's important, because we don't have a lot of room to maneuver. We don't have a lot of ability to change the market. Okay. Unemployment is up, and our credit rating is down. And very base financial metrics, degrees of relativity. Okay. Those of you who understand it, other markets, the market here is still good. The reality is, we're not in a zero sum game anymore. We're in a contracting market. And that's important to understand because there are more players in this market than there are worth in many spaces. So you've got to compete and you've got to win. And when you win, somebody else wins. And I'm going to talk about exponential business failure and exponential business growth. But it's important to understand this and to recognize the market and what's happening. So not to be fearful of it, but just understand the context in which we're living. Just a few, few slides from uh, global publications around the world. I want to share it with you because one of the fundamental aspects of doing business is to understand that markets are cyclical. Okay? Markets go up and markets go down. I guarantee it. I can't tell you when, and anybody who can tell me when, speak to me afterwards. <laughs> we never have to work again. Okay? People talk about timing the market. Yes, you can be intuitive around it. The reality is I've never seen anybody do it. And if you knew how to time the market, you wouldn't have to work. You'd be a billionaire. Don't work for a hedge fund. Okay? But this has happened before, and it will happen again. It might happen tomorrow, next week. There will be another upswing in WA, and there will be another downswing. But when you're working in an upswing, you need to understand that there's a downswing coming at some point in time. So future-proof your business around it. So people have traditionally very short memories. I mean, the Lehman Brothers collapse was one of the biggest financial incidents in the world. People forgot about it. Five years ago, five, six years ago. People have forgotten about the GFC. Europe's growing, UK's growing, US is growing. Arguably, it's done on, on false money and quantitative easing, but irrespective, those economies are growing. We've forgotten all about the GFC. People are remortgaging their houses, they're buying five houses, they're high leverage themselves 20 to 1. They've forgotten what happened last time. As humans, we do this. So you have to continue to check yourself against the market and understand where you are in that respect. So what can we as a collective do about it? We've got some business owners here, we've got some people that work for businesses, we've got senior people, we've got junior people, we've got industry groups, you know, we've got speakers. What can we do about it? What can we do about the market? Nothing. Okay? Quick you realize that, that unless you're sitting here and I've got some innovative ideas around reducing taxes, you know stimulus measures, etc., etc. There's nothing you can do about the market. And I would argue quite aggressively, and others would argue against me, is that markets are ultimately free. Anyway, even control markets at some point in time will be free. You can beat the market, it'll beat you. Long term, the market will beat you, okay? And the reason I point that out is because I see in many businesses people saying, the market will change if we do this, if we do that. It doesn't work. Okay? There's nothing you and I can do to influence the price of our own. It's happening elsewhere in the world. The geopolitical factors beyond our control. I, I love this, this slide. Some of you will have seen this on television. So I think this is the new Samsung Curve TV. Very cool, by the way, if you can see these things. Uh, also very expensive. But there's this guy, and he's sitting in the middle of an arena, and he's in a dressing gown. Okay? And I, I love this, this, this parallel because when the market changes, the rules change, the arena changes, the players change, the tactics that your competitors are adopting change, their outlook changes, okay? So the arena in which you're playing changes. If you do the same thing, you will be the guy in the dressing gown in the middle of the flat arena. You will lose, and you will lose badly. So understand the changing market, and understand the arena in which you're playing, okay? You can equip yourself with the right tools, systems, and processes. You can equip yourself with the right abilities and staff to compete in that market. But if you do nothing, you will lose because other people will quit themselves. For those of you who are familiar with psychology, these are the five stages of grief. And you'll see them, uh, and you may be able to relate them to your own businesses, to how people go about a downswing market. So denial is the most dangerous thing. Okay? And you'll, you'll have heard it in your businesses. You know, We've had a bad month. We've had a bad January. January is always a slow month. We'll have a better month in February. February's a bit off as well. There's some long lead times. Uh, March is a bit off. There's something big coming down the line. Six months later, we've lost a lot of money. We're in denial. We're in denial. In other businesses, you'll see them take a step further. We no longer share our PL with our business. You know, when you hear that panic, 
So we go through this denial process, and then we have we have anger. You see this all the time. I'm really angry at what's happening in the iron ore space. Why aren't juniors getting funding? Why isn't the price up here? Why isn't more projects happening? Et cetera, et cetera. I never heard it when, when things were good. The price of iron was 180. Look at all these projects, we're making a fortune. Again, take it back to understanding markets go up and markets go down. So we move to the angry food. Then this is a really interesting one. You see it as well, bargaining. If we do this, it'll be okay. If we do that, it'll be okay. Can't change the market. Accept it. And then depression. And for me, this is, and Mark's going to talk about this as well, it's very dangerous to your business. If you guys are leaders within your business, if you're depressed about your business, if you're depressed about the outlook, things aren't going to go well for you. And then ultimately, you reach acceptance. The reason I show you this is because if you can move through this process in two months, you can get out there, you can put tactics in place, you can start to win again. If this takes you a year, you're going to run out of money. If you're a small entity, you're running money in three months. If you're a big entity, you might not run out of money because they're making money elsewhere. But you as an individual come under pressure. Okay? You can't beat the market. So accept what's in front of you and learn how to play in it. This is interesting. You might be able to relate to this. And this is how I see this play out. And I've seen it. It's almost the same in every company, actually. It's almost the same in every firm that I've worked with. I'm talking about professional services. So we go through the denial phase. And then we say, you know what? The market is changing. We need to do something. So we take our FY14 strategy and we put it in the bin. And that's all we do. And I not only do we not know what we're doing, we'll have the strategy. Okay. We bid everything. This is crazy. Chase everything. I used to have 10 leads, I've got 100 leads, I've got 150 leads, I've got 160 leads. And we chase them and we bid them. And we network. If you guys are all here today thinking networking, I guarantee you some of your selling, and I guarantee you some of your socializing. Understand the difference between the three. That's a whole separate topic <coughs> in itself. And we cut costs. Do you get the note from head office? We're not making as much money. What are we going to do? Let's cut the business development director. Let's cut the marketing team. Let's cut the strategy guy. It's great. Lost a bit of cost there. What have we done? Our overheads have stayed the same. So our cost per man hour has gone up. These are probably well-paid people, so we have to pay them redundancy. So all of a sudden, we have a massive spike in our cost over two months. What do we do then? We discount. In the market, we discount. We discount, we discount, we discount. And we discount some more. And we create a loss-led market, a cost-led market. Why would we do that? We just put our costs up. So we put our costs up, and we're making the market based on cost. It's crazy, and the two move away from each other. Forget about the PL, forget about our cost of sale, just chasing everything, chasing blindly. We've got some really good existing customers. We've got five existing customers. What happens when you chase 100? Forget about them. Someone else will pick them up. I'm going to lose. We've been through this cycle. What do we do? We go back to the start. We'll chase even more. We'll make even more people redundant and our costs will be even further up. And we get into what I call exponential business business. And there is a point here, I don't want to shock you, for which a business can't be rescued. There is a point here where you have to make an interjection around your cost, your structure, in terms of being in the market. And you need to know where that is, because you'll reach it quickly. So what should you do? It sounds very scary. It's not. You're just going to learn how to play. You know, you'd feel a lot better in that arena instead of dressing in a dressing gown in a tank. That's what I'm trying to do for you. I'm trying to give you the tools and equipment to do that. So this is the worst piece of advice anybody can ever give you. It's retrospective advice, okay? but it's important. The next slide I'm going to show you is critical that you understand where you are in the upswing of the downswing trend. Four sectors of strategy. Anybody who's a business background will well understand this. Existing customer statistics service is the bottom left hand of the corner. This is where you get most of your revenue from. Very low cost of sales, low investment, business as usual. Keep these guys happy and just keep the money through the business. Okay? But when things are going well, spend money. Diversify your product range. Diversify your customer offering. It's easily done when you're making money. It's easily done in an upswing. Next, next card I'm going to show you is going to explain to you why it's difficult when things are going badly. And look, I'm a great advocate of innovation. I think that's why a lot of you guys are here. New services 
a new customer, it works out. Get a first mover advantage, make the market, make projects. That's where you make serious money, where you don't have to compete with monopolization. And these are two quotes. I couldn't place them, I didn't have enough time, but you know, I like to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And timing the market is a close game. Okay, like I said before, you'll hear it all the time. China will come back, the price of iron oil will go up. If you know that, you know, you're a rock star, you're a billionaire overnight. Nobody knows that. Okay. As soon as you accept that, you can move on. This is pro I've done this four, five times now, where I've gone to businesses and, and, and sort of retweaked them and reset them, and, and we've made a lot of money down today. And this is the most important graphic I have in my toolkit. Because whether you're a managing director or whether you're a graduate, you have somebody that internally you'll have to speak to. So you might have a board, shareholders, a boss, director, etc. And you will all see, and you've seen them before, revenue line moving down today, going straight back up. Has anybody seen them? I've seen one yesterday. Okay. Panic. Why would your revenue curve go straight back up? I haven't done anything different. Blind faith. Okay. Blind faith. What this shows you is business sigmoid curves. So every business will grow to a point, and then you've got to do something different to continue that growth. <coughs> Make an acquisition, have a new service line, change the location, diversify, etc. etc. So the reason I show it to you is to grow To grow, you have to invest. To invest time, you have to invest money, you have to resource. And that reconciles cost. Now that sometimes is difficult to do when you're making money. It's very difficult to do when you're losing money. So what you have to say to your managing director, your shareholder, you know what? Markets change, we're losing money. I need another three months to lose some more money before we go on the upswing. So you know, you do the same thing again and again, you get the same result. Should have done when we're here. You could have done this, you go further down, but you have to do it. So this is a curve I use all the time to present to my management and my our shareholders to, to explain what we're doing and how we're doing. So what do we do? Macro plan stuff. Well, I've got a good friend of mine who's a pilot. And uh, I don't know if any of you know pilots, they've got a certain nature about them. And I, I'm an awful golfer. I mean, an awful golfer. And so we go out and play golf maybe once a month. And I hack my way around there. So when he hits two shots and he's on the green, it's going to take me another six or seven to get there. And he's very calm, very pleasant. So when I'm hacking away, I'm thinking, how's this guy not lost his temper? How's he not lost his mind? Why is he still playing with me? Because he's a pilot. In his nature to be calm as a seagull. And I draw that parallel as well. One of the toughest things you guys have is you'll have market noise around you okay, all the time. So be bold, be decisive, be calm, back yourselves. When a pilot's flying a plane, and has a bit of an emergency, they don't panic. If they panic, they're all dead. Seriously. Same with business. It's just going to take you longer. Okay? If you panic, so be bold, be decisive, look at your strategy, look at the market, go back and set the direction. You'll hear it every day, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this, we're doing that, disaster. Back yourself, set your strategy, review it every quarter. And that should be tweaks, it shouldn't be fundamental shifts in direction. If you do that, you just come back to square one. And think from art, understand the most critical success factor in my experience, particularly in WA, is cultural maturity. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna flip through this rather quickly, but these are the four pillars about effective, sustainable market behavior for business stuff. Okay. You need to tell people why. It sounds ridiculous. Why do we need to do more business in the design this way? Well, for me, it means like PL, it means shareholder returns. To my expert in geotechnics, it may mean more projects, it may mean more holidays, it may mean more training, etc. You have to relate the goal to the individual need. You need to show them how, you need to give them structures, processes, systems, roadmap. You've got to show them direction that you're going, give them visibility and strategic focus endorsing measure and leadership. You guys are in this room because you're leaders. Okay? You have a responsibility to the people who work with you, work for you. If you're weak as a leader, you're letting your people down. Without strong leadership, I've been in businesses with weak leadership, there's nothing you can do. The best business plan in the world, the best strategy in the world. Without that strong leadership, you simply can do it. This is professional services uh, kind of one-on-one. So I like to refresh people. This is a uh, do a shallow business development executive model. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to implement business development throughout the business. So 
So people can win, sustain their own work to a certain degree. What this does is it removes reliance on one person, de risks your business. Um, and it also gives that executive more time to win the big deals. Your average geotech engineer, product scientist, cannot win a $10 million deal. Your business development executive should be able to if he or she has enough time. So what this does enables it frees up their time to continually step change the business. Does it work? Yeah, it does. I've got my career on it. UK, zero to three million down swing market. People going to business all around it, we're making money. <laughs> Middle East, I don't remember, so it was there last week. Zero to two million. These are professional, professional fees, 12 months. Um, took over a water business. Again, this is in eight months. There's no restructure. Losing a lot of money. Was making a lot of money in eight months. Now. And this is my particular uh, favorite one I'm most proud of. 20 million, 16 million, in 18 months. Okay. That's in a downswing market. 300% growth in 18 months in a downswing market. And most recently, we were acquired at the WA. So we had a second, seven figure loss. Uh, 12 months later, we had we a seven figure profit. So, in my opinion, it does work. Why do people not do it? Nothing I've told you today is rocket science. Do an MBA, read the hardest business review, you should go online and work the stuff out. Why do people not do it? Because they're afraid. The unknown scares people. If you're used to doing business in one particular climate, a different market will scare you. When people fall back into that flight or flight mode, that reptilian brain methodology, where you just do nothing, or more, more fatally, are pulled in different directions by people in the room. That's absolutely fair. So I suppose the question is, will you, will you adopt some of these methodologies? And that, that's a question for you, how you raise that for your business. And just to finish, what I've shown you is A, B, C, and D. The critical success factor to implementing this in your business is cultural change. It is the most important thing. Without it, you will simply not be successful. And that's a nice segue in, into Mark, who's going to give you some insights into that particular uh, part of the presentation. Thank you. <coughs> okay, I'll just do a very quick um, intro to me. Um, just a bit of a disclaimer as well. Some of you may have seen me on the panel yesterday morning. Um, both Ryan and I don't work in the area of the field. We don't work in this industry. Um, however, I've worked with organisations that, that um, obviously do. So. Um, my, my specialty, my background is really in working in organisational psychology and we, we specialise as consultancy and culture change, strategy development, execution and leadership development amongst some other things. Um, and there's a, a few other things down there that might be of interest to you. Um, I, I guess one of the reasons why uh, Ryan and I are speaking together is because um, A, we've worked fairly closely together um, over the last um, 12 to 18 months, but I think there's another piece as well which is really important to me, particularly from a cultural perspective, and that is that um, a lot of people will go, culture, that's fluff, that's the soft stuff. Whereas well, what I'm trying to encourage people to do is understand that culture isn't fluff. It's about saying we need to think very, very um, objectively about how we run an organisation and sometimes that means making very, very tough decisions um, to shift culture over time. Um, and it's not unusual that I go into an organisation and do some culture work. Um, one of the first things that I identify is the number of people that have to go. And we, we need to make that happen pretty quickly because the cultural change exercise is going to be um, hampered by uh, people that, that hold the organisation back. But we've really struggled to move people on um, in this country, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, many of you probably would have seen this quote before, Saturday's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. We are actually in a situation now where you know, the global financial crisis happened you know, six, seven years ago now, a long time ago, but what we're still finding is that um, businesses are still doing the same things over and over and over and are really, really struggling. And I know, you know, the sentiment that I've picked up over the last couple of days at this conference has actually been probably fairly positive, um, and certainly not to come across as, as negative, but, you know, things do change. And so there will, you know, there will be a cycle, and at some point in time, the market will shift. And, you know, how, how will you adapt to it? How prepared are you for, um, for what will happen when the market shifts? Are you thinking about doing things differently? And are all people in the organisation thinking about doing things differently? Um, why, why am I even here? So this is this is an interesting question. I, I've, I've been invited back to Bindaya uh, um, this year, and, and one of the things that I've realised is that a lot of the problems that were being discussed at last year's Bindaya are the same problems that are being discussed at this year's Bindaya. And um, I had conversations last night um, over several drinks with a number of people. Some of them aren't here. 
and I know that they were supposed to be, so maybe they didn't make it, um, about the need for change in the industry as a whole. So um, the uh, I'll talk probably in one of my final slides about the industry, but the, the need for the industry to change its collective mindset as an industry about how we work together, um, how we um, you know, remain competitive uh, on the global stage, and how we um, you know, increase productivity uh, on a national level. For your business, obviously, you know, you can't keep doing the same things over and over, but we'd love to because that's a, it's a comfort zone. It worked in the past, even if it hasn't been working for the last six years, at some point in time, we're pretty sure that it's going to work again. It probably isn't. So we need to think about that. And for yourself <laughs> as well, people have got to make themselves marketable because, you know, I know some people in the room will be business owners, but others aren't. And at some point in time, you may decide that you want to look for another opportunity. What are you doing about your brand? Are you doing the same thing every single day um, and not improving yourself, not changing the way that you do things? You want to market yourself. If you want to improve your brand, you need the full mindset shift to be able to look at things differently. Research has shown that companies that do adaptive performance enhanced cultures enjoy up to 516% of greater revenues and 246% expansion in workforce. This is some fairly old research, but I keep doing research that keeps telling us that, hey, if you've got a constructive culture, you get higher earnings. You know, we're trying to bring culture and profit, we're trying to bring culture and tangible metrics together, because in the past it hasn't been, it's been a bit wishy-washy. But what, what, we, what we often see, particularly in a tough market, is um, natural, aggressive defensive styles, be really competitive um, with your, your colleagues, um, you know, make sure that you, you win at all costs, and Ryan had an extensive slide of points there. A lot of that's really quite, can be quite aggressive behaviour in the workplace. And what we find is that the research will show that over time, your earnings will go like this, because we, we push people really, really hard, they go out to the market, and all of a sudden we get a spike. But then people aren't collaborating, they're working against each other, and you know, the, the, maybe the, the um, services that are being provided aren't of high quality, and then we have the dip. So if we can build a constructive culture where people are focused on achievement of realistic goals, um, you know, building pride and excitement, openness to change in the workforce, collaboration, a humanistic, supportive um, uh, you know, way of working, we know that over time, the earnings, they might not hit the same heights as your aggressive culture, but you're gonna find that they're a lot more constant. So more and more research is supporting this. I'm gonna show a little video. Um, this is a, a, a great little video, and it takes a few minutes, so bear with me. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this is because, if I can get my little pointer on that thing, um, there's a really, really good loading in this. My name is Tony Shea. Uh, this is Bruce. My name is Abby Morris. And this here is Mr. Becker. And him and I kind of started the new hire program back with the three other team members about five and a half years ago. Yeah. The Falcon's core values um, are deliver well through service, be humble, be passionate and determined, do more with less, build a positive team and family good, embrace and drive change, pursue growth and learning, be adventurous, creative, and open minded. Open the door for people. That's not one of them. Create some awareness. awareness. Develop relationships or build relationships with open and honest communication. How was anybody on that? So it doesn't involve me being at work, but I walk because I went to the store yesterday to get ice for the pop for a party we had, and there was two 20s sitting in the cash register dispenser. Like someone had gotten cash and not taken it. And a part of me was like, I could take this, and nobody would know. And then the other part of me was like, that would never be okay. And I'm gonna wow the person who got this cash and forgot it, and I'm gonna give it to the cash register, and I'm gonna be honest. And I'm not saying before Zappos I would have taken it, but I will say at Zappos, when you leave here and when you work here, you do become a better person just because of the core values, because of the culture, because of the, the directors or the leadership. And it does take you outside of the company. And you do, you do talk about the company a lot and, and, and you think about things before you do them. And that's what I thought. You're representing Zappos, whether you're at, at the office or 
outside the office. And so definitely always try to act in a way that's consistent with both our core values that we have as a company, which basically are also my own personal values and uh, also keeping in mind kind of the overall uh, mission of the company, which is about delivering happiness. We are about delivering happiness. We really want to, even if it's just for a moment, change somebody's life when they open up that box and they get something that maybe they've been waiting for, something they need, uh, something for their, their kids or their family or their loved one that they've been wanting to get. And uh, for that moment, we're able to take them out of, out of their place and, uh, and, and put them in that happy place, put them in that, uh, in that setting where they really experience uh, something great. For me, that's pretty awesome to be able to do that. And to know that we do that on a regular basis, and we're not thinking about just the bottom line, um, that's a great purpose. It's, it's a reason to get out of bed in the morning. We all believe in the same thing. We're all wearing, you know, metaphorically the same thing. At least we all have the same guidelines um, in which we go through our daily routine, not only just in the office, but outside of the office as well. And I think with vision, I mean, if we're talking about like how do we get invested in like new, new concepts, I think it's because we share the same core values. And so like even when we started, um, you know, uh, announcing like our new vision was delivering happiness, like it just made sense. It was like the right progression um, because again, we shared the same values. So we were kind of excited to take it beyond um, just our culture and taking it, uh, it wasn't, I guess, it wasn't a surprise at all. We were really excited to have it happen. I think the thing that companies really can learn from Zappos and from being here and experiencing uh, what we experience on, on every day is, is the value that the company places on the employees. Uh, there's actually a, uh, uh, the idea of you know, customer service. When I first started working here, I thought you know, Zappos is all about the customer. And the reality of it is Zappos is all about the employee because we take care of the employees and because the company takes care of us, that spills out over into our customer service. So really, customer service is a result of the fact that the company cares about me and invests in me and uh, pours what they can into me. I think the most important values are, you know, leaning on each other, having that family environment, because everyone will grow to have a pride of ownership of what the final product is. There is something in Zappos that shines the sky in the corporate America that that leaves a, a glowing mark with, with people, and I think that's that's the core of the company. I'm valued as an individual, as a person, and uh, I add something to the company. I'm not, I'm not just taking from me. Uh, but they're investing in me. They let you do what you want to do, and they trust the employee, and that trust really makes makes a wonderful working experience. Kind of long story short, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Zappos, it's an online shoe retailer sold to Amazon for 1.2 billion online shoe retailer and people talk about working for an online shoe retailer like that. So um, Tony Shea, you might have seen speaking quite monotonous, not really that exciting or inspiring or charismatic, doesn't you don't need to be. You don't need to be that charismatic motivational speaker to be a good leader. Um, you just have a really good vision and he said from day dot, culture and values, culture and values, that's how we build our business. And for months people work for him for free because they'd run out of money. And he believed that, you know, that they were going to achieve this $1.2 billion later, um, you know, pretty successful story. Um, just just some, some food for thought. Consider some of the questions that are up on the screen. Is every person in your organization committed to adapting to the market and fully focused on business growth? People energetic, calm, composed, or burnt out? Do members talk about leaving when the next opportunity comes up or are they absolutely committed to the organization? Do people help each other out or compete with each other? They embrace change or resist it. Do people see contractors as competitors or potential opportunities? Do you see your customers as frustrating or annoying? You know, it's interesting to, to maybe consider some of these questions because whilst we might like to go, no, no, we're, you know, we're all sorted, we're all good, when we actually ask ourselves, you know, honestly, you know, how do we really operate and how do our people operate? Sometimes the answer to those questions is, is actually a little bit uncomfortable. We've got a whole bunch of other questions that we could ask you as well. 
And this is, this is a product of, of your culture. And I want to just to show you a couple of other um, slides before I get onto a fairly simple model which might help to explain some of that. Um, in terms of factors that uh, have been ranked in, in having the biggest impact on, on culture, well, one of the issues that we have is that people in the workplace believe the culture of, um, is a product of a couple of things, and managers and executives tend to think it's a product of something else. It's got a bit of a divide here, and one of the things that I guess I'm trying to do in the work that I, I do is, is bridge that divide, help that build that understanding. <coughs> so in the research that was done this was through Deloitte, they found the executives believe that financial performance of the organisation and competitive compensation are important um, if you're in a good culture. But the employees are actually saying good access to management, employee recognition, regular cancer communication. I can honestly tell you, if I run a focus group throughout an organisation, it's so consistent with that. I want to be rewarded and recognised for a hard day's work. You know, I want development opportunities. I want access to my manager to have a good conversation. I want fairness and equity in the workplace. In fact, money's not the motivator, but hey, make sure it's not um, you know, lacking fairness and equity. As soon as I'm getting paid a lot less than that person over there and I'm performing more than them, I'm going to feel pretty upset about it. It's pretty basic stuff. And this little simple model might help to sort of understand some of the points that came up before as well. And this is doing a lot of work on this at the moment. Literally this model, just having conversations with, with management around what you're doing when you have a bad month is you go, I'm going to focus on the performance metrics, revenue was down, damn. What was the activities that you did last month, or what didn't you do, or how did you perform those activities? That's why performance is down. But what we have to understand is that if somebody's underperforming or not achieving their KPIs, something to do with their mindset or their attitude or their beliefs, their, their general paradigm about how they come to work, have a conversation here first. How are you feeling about coming to work at the moment? Because one of the things that we tend to find is that sometimes people are disengaged. Maybe it's time for them to move on. If we actually focus on trying to motivate people here, this stuff becomes really easy. So, you know, I've got an organisation that I've worked with you know, the last couple of years, and, I, and one of the things I found when I started working with them is, is every, every time there was some, a, a challenge around performance, what would happen is, oh, we probably need to put them through more training. It's, it's not the answer, I can assure you. Let's, have an under, let's get some understanding about where, where people are thinking and feeling at the moment. And that's not soft. That's not a warm and fuzzy, how do you feel about things right now? It's actually saying, look, the performance is down. I need to understand what's in your head at the moment that might be impacting on that. So in terms of the, the culture transformation, I'm sort of going to move through this um, fairly quickly because of uh, the, the time. But one of the things that people always ask is, how do you actually go in and, and change culture? And here's a, a number of simple steps that, that seem to be working. And you know, obviously, there's a lot more that sits behind this. But one of the things that we, we find is that leadership alignment, when an organisation is not performing that well, or even performing OK or wants to improve, the leadership alignment at the top level is, is an issue. If people aren't aligned around the same vision, um, they might be missing a strategy or a plan. Like, there might be nothing there, so it's sort of, you know, hoping for the best, as Ryan said earlier on. Well, what we need to do is understand that there's, there's got to be some expectations around values, attitudes and behaviours. I know that you might have heard before people go, values and behaviours, values and behaviours, but we need to understand the attitudes that people have, but we also need to help people build those attitudes as well. The Zappos example is great for that. Um, focus on real organisational metrics, and mine talked a lot about that. That's bringing the tangible stuff into culture. It's, this is, you know, this is where people can get stuck around the warm and fuzzy, but we need to actually make sure that there's, there's something tangible at the end. Personal transformation of leaders and individual contributors. Well, the reason I say that is because what happens is, I've seen in the past, you know, culture change or change management type of programs, they target the leadership group, and then they stop there, right? You can work on those people, but you know, you get a huge amount of insight from other people in the organisation as well. And sometimes, you know, you're missing the opportunity to, to have person, you know, to experience personal transformation of those people. Um, and most importantly, and this is where I do a lot of work, changing beliefs, symbols, values, norms, rights, and stories. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. <coughs> So, in terms of another great success story, some of you might be familiar with Lion Nation, otherwise you know, Lion, they brew a lot of beer. Um, they, they went through a massive culture transformation journey from 1998 onwards, and they've even got some other updated stats on this. And Lion Nation, the CEO will tell you that the only reason that their share price and their revenues and everything else is, you know, is moved up exponentially is because of the work that they've done in culture. I, mean, I know people who work there, and they will tell you exactly the same story. It's very, very similar to Zappos almost a little bit evangelical, but people leave, they go to work for somebody else, and then they go, I, I need to go back and work for Lyme, because it's such a great place to work. A local story, um, seven-figure seven loss, 
seven-figure profit in 12 months. Now, the, the process that I showed you before was the process that this organization was taken through. And this is what's happened in the 12-month period in a pretty tough market for this organization. We had multiple rounds of redundancies prior to that. Now they're recruiting new team members. Staff engagement was low. Now there's excitement and optimism. You know, you can see the, the from and to there. It's actually pretty drastic what's happened. And really one of the key, key things that's happened there is leadership alignment, people working towards a plan, people developing some sort of commercial or business acumen. In business, that is so, so important. What I find is that a lot of organisations hold back on sharing financial information or sharing business information from employees because some degree of fear, what that's about. But if you build that business understanding, people won't challenge some of the decisions that you make as much because they will have an understanding of why the business decision has to be made. And that is a critical issue for a lot of organisations. Okay, so in terms of why the change fails, and, and you know, I've experienced this with organisations I've worked with because um, you know, this is this is a, a natural natural occurrence that starts to feel good. So you take the foot off. Oh, we've done the culture change thing. We've made some money. Now we can just rest and, and you know relax. And sometimes I call it the, the premiership hangover. It's a bit like football, where the <coughs> team wins the grand final and the next year they end up 13th. Report supporter. <laughs> it's, it's happened a couple of times. Well, grand finals anyway. Failing to create appropriate appropriate structure for change. So that's the infrastructure for the change, but it's also the structure of the organisation. Underestimating the so there's a, an area there, the power of vision. Um, you know, you, you need to be able to provide some sort of point in time in the future where we say this is where we're going, everyone, and we really want you to come on that journey with us. And if people say I don't like that journey, we actually can have a conversation with them and say, would you like to self-select out? Because if you don't want to come on the journey with this organisation, we think you can hold us back. And sometimes people will do that. Taking small wins is the climax. This is a, a, an issue that I've found over time. You know, we've had a great month, so the work's done. We're all good from here. Under communicating the vision, exercise. So all the reasons why the vision, values, and culture change is stalling. Ah, oh, you know, we tried to get this done, but you know, the market's tough at the moment. Blah blah blah. Not achieving or celebrating short-term wins, and people are still thinking about the individual over team, which we see a lot. So in terms of steps to to the uh, successful change management around culture. Um, look, I'll let you read through this, but I mean, one of the, the key issues here is getting a tipping point. And often we say that 70% of the organisation need to be behind something for it to actually get some leaks. That's just, you know, it's a figure that, that has been thrown around that we tend to find that's fairly consistent with the work that we do. If you have a couple of people in the organisation that want to create change, but you've got a whole bunch of people that are, you know, are resisting it completely against it, you're going to find that that's a pretty tough journey um, and it's going to require a long period of time. So why is it so hard to change culture? I'm mindful of the fact that we've got 10 minutes of me. Are these all right? Ten yeah. Minutes. yeah. Um, what I'll do is I'll show this video at the end. Six. So, sorry? Six. Six. I'll show this video at the end just so you can um, finish up on it. Um, but in the context of, of this particular conference, one of the things that I've, I've given quite a lot of thought to is how does this fit? And there's a couple of parts to this. One is the industry. One of the things that I've found in the industry um, through the two thin day I sort of attended is that there still appears to be a, a competition over collaboration mindset in some, some pockets. Um, there's, a, a, there's a lot of conventional thinking and the way that businesses are operating, like I said earlier on, doing the same thing over and over, um, and resisting doing things a little bit differently. One of the things that needs to happen also is removing hierarchies um, and bringing everybody to the same table. This came out in the, the panel yesterday morning in that you know, there are, uh, and I've found this in my profession in organisational psychology, I'll have um, grads come through and they think that they're awesome. Where organisational psychologists are better than those HR people, and we're better than those training people, and we're better than those OHS people. And I say, why? Why are you so much better than these people? You know, it's, it's an even playing field. We're all playing a different role. Don't be precious about your background and how awesome you are. Everybody plays a role, and we just need to come to the same table and have good conversations of improving productivity. And your organisation must develop a new collective mindset. We call it collective mindset. That's the culture of the organisation. That's what drives the culture. To work into the future, not what's going to happen today and tomorrow, but what are we going to do into the future? New ways of resourcing work, new ideas on how to adapt to the market, new ways of winning work, and then 100% accountability and no excuses, which if I go into organisations, one of the things I often find is that there's really low accountability. And we also know that the research shows in Australia and New Zealand that we have high avoidance culture, which you know it means that we avoid tough conversations, 
we avoid dealing with, with difficult circumstances. I put this quote in because it related to the, the, the BIM, you know, the, the BIM concept and the, the, the industry change that needs to happen. One, one of the things that's come up in the two BIM days I've attended is people worrying about losing IP, people worrying about losing staff, sharing of information, the fact that things become public all of a sudden. I think one of the things that we need to accept is that people want to copy it, smile and accept the fact that you've obviously done such a good job that people want to plagiarise your work in one way or another. Accept it, it's going to happen. You know, the, the information age, things are public now, everything's available. And, and this is probably just a final note in terms of culture. This was a, a statement that was made to me probably about you know, 12 months ago and it was from a, um, a local business leader here that was going through a culture transformation process and I thought this was really interesting. And because people come to me and they say, why are you doing so much work in culture? I was thinking the current market, people want to spend money on it. And that was the reason. He said, we've tried everything else. We've actually, you know, we've tried to put these new systems, we've done these audits, we've done continuous improvement, we've done this and that, the other blah, we've done this, blah, 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 blah. Just went on forever. And then we realised that it was the culture of the organisation that was that collective mindset issue. We couldn't get people getting behind the organisation to change and move forward. So that was why they went on a culture transformation journey and were able to move forward. So this is the, the I guess the summary of the, the presentation, and I will leave you with that last video I've got. Um, we've got a, a two-day masterclass that we run on um, on culture, and I don't want to be doing the sell thing, but part of what I want to try and explain is that we, we're trying to, to tie this back to market adaptability, profit, business growth in a tough market. So if it's something of interest, um, get in contact. Um, we've also got a, I've developed a little um, customer service culture um, audit, and it's qualitative, so it's it's give, it's good food for thought. So if you want to email me, and I'll send it through. Um, I think that, that's it. Any questions? For, for Ryan or myself? So I've only got one question yeah. for Ryan. Is it possible to go back to the, to the slide with the, the steps on it? I didn't sure. quite grasp all that. Oh, yeah, to be fair, I kind of skimmed through it rather quickly. I'm just conscious my, my time is going out. Yeah, happy to do so. That's yes. oh. uh, And I know where you step yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, okay. perfect. Yeah. So, what this is effectively showing you in a professional services organization, there's two models you can run with. There's a seller model, which is more attuned to your product environment. So basically what a seller model is, is you've got 150 staff, I'll go out and sell for them. So I'll go out and generate revenue, margin, all the rest of it. That does two things. One, you'll be heavily exposed to that individual. If they have any sort of aptitude about them at all, they'll continue to leverage you to the point where it's totally unpalatable and then they'll go. Um, it also makes you very exposed. If they do go, literally your business runs out of customers and revenue overnight. The approach that we advocate is a uh, do or seller model and a zipper approach to customers. So what I'm looking to do is, the business needs about 12 million a year to, 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 to continue where it is. So every, every person in that organization, whether they're a graduate or director, has some level of responsibility around engaging the market and generating, um, I, I hear the word sales, generating buys from, from their customer. Um, and if you draw the parallels, we've got 70 staff. I want the 70 staff to spend two to three hours in the market a week, because it's 210 hours and 40 of my time. So 250 hours of market time we have a week. It's much more engaging, it's much more sustainable. Also, I've got nothing to say to a junior tech, we're on different wavelengths. Um, so you'll be able to zipper your customers up, get much more relevance to them at every single level, feed your business with opportunities. What it also does, and they may have alluded to, is that you know your project managers can't go out and win $10 million complicated deal with financing and debt, they just can't do it, it's not their skill set. Just in the same way that I can't do project management at that level, your business development deck you should be able to do that. It frees their time up to do the more complex, bigger sales, the higher buyer, buyer entry customers, and to build them into the business, and you just do it block by block. So that you hopefully you have a $10 million business, you want a $5 million deal, and that's not a $15 million business, and then you do another $5 million deal, it's a $20 million business, and you just build it up like that. That's the theory, um, it's the approach I would always advocate in consulting, um, so that's the, the theory behind that, that model. Uh, I guess I'll also summarise just responding to um, quite a few um, conversations I had last night with people because they came up and they were you know, asking about the change stuff. And, and that is that, you know, old school change management, trying to put new processes in place and, and trying to get people to adopt them is, is just not working anymore. You know, change management really is about how do we get into somebody's mind and understand what actually makes them tick, what motivates them, what excites them, 
and what is it what is it we, we need to try and work with them on to be able to, to come to work and be motivated, to work hard, to work smart, to, to be open to change. And, and, and that's something that it, it's very important to understand. It, you can't change masses um, that easily. You need to be able to understand what, what it is each person in your organisation needs um, to be able to, to move forward. And guess what? If they don't want to, sometimes you've just got to make some tough calls and say, we need an A-team to move this organisation forward. We don't have that A-team. Some of these people will need to move on in one way or another, and we need to find the talent. Because if you look at an AFL football team, what do they do at the end of the year? They list three players because they have to, and they go to the draft, and they find the talent. I mean, if we all ran organisations like a football team like that, you know, business would be a lot easier. Come up and speak to Ryan and myself in the breaks um, if you want to chat further about this. I understand that we've um, presented you know, a huge amount of content. That's a two-hour presentation. I've tried to squeeze in 20 minutes. So um, if you want to chat with us further, I'm more than happy to talk. Um, I think that we're about to get kicked out, but I wouldn't mind just showing this last video if you've got a minute, because it's quite funny. Culture is very much about conformity. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff, will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups Change positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use. Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie Single, everybody turns forward. You ready? Notice they take off their hats. <laughs> and now, do you think we can reverse the procedure? Watch. <laughs> it's a good illustration of tipping place, though.